So, we have now survived the Babylonian exile. <laughs> uh, sort of. It, from one point of view, you might say they never quite got over it. Actually, do I have is this on? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, you know Jerusalem was destroyed 586. All the prominent people were taken off to Babylon. Uh, how desolate the land was left is an open question, and much disputed. But certainly, uh, it was decimated. There was very little there. Insofar as there was a city at all, it wasn't in Jerusalem. Um, uh, but then, about well, less than 50 years later, uh, Cyrus of Persia, whom we met briefly in Second Isaiah, conquered Babylon. And Cyrus issued an edict which has survived, called the Cyrus Cylinder. It was on display in this country a year or two ago, um, allowing certain people to return home and to take their gods with them. How do you take your god with you? Well, the statue. Because this was one of the things they did when they took people captive, they took the gods as well, which was a way of humiliating them and emphasizing the degree of the defeat. Now, presumably, the Judeans didn't have a statue to take back. What they say they took back were temple vessels. Judah is not mentioned in the decree of Cyrus and the Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, it's plausible enough that Judeans were allowed to return. Uh, evidently, some of them did return at some point, and you couldn't just get up and go, I imagine, without the, uh, the stamp of approval from the, uh, from the authorities. So according, certainly according to the Bible, you had a return shortly after 539. And a man named Shesh Bazar is said to have laid the foundation of the temple. But apparently, Shesh Bazar didn't get the job done. And it took another 20 years before they built the temple. When they did, the man who laid the foundation was Zerubbabel. And, you know, I, mean, I don't see any great reason to doubt the veracity of any of this, that there were two attempts to do it. But it shows, you see, that the people who came back initially probably didn't have a whole lot of resources. In the book of Ezra, they say that, uh, that Cyrus says, and let the people of the place where they live generously provide for them. But now, if you're funding the building of a temple by counting on your neighbors to generously provide for you, uh, that may go some way to explaining why you don't get the job done. So they probably didn't have a whole lot. Uh, then, in, after 20 years, also according to the, the book of Ezra, then two prophets arose urging people to get on with the building of the temple. And these prophets we have in Haggai and Zechariah. In the book of Ezra, chapter 3, I'll just read you a little passage. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple, this now would be the second time round. Um, the, uh, the priests and their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, all singing, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy, his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first temple on its foundation, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house because it was such a puny replacement. And 
it says, the people couldn't distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the shout of the people's weeping. I always think of this passage in connection with the renovation of Yale Divinity School about 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> shortly after I first came here. And there, again, you know, for the new generation, this was wonderful and certainly a huge improvement over what it had been for a while. And then people like Professor Wilson, who had seen the first house in all its glory, <laughs> may not quite have wept, but I think were probably not quite as elated about the renovation. But anyhow, let's turn to the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, in the book of Haggai, the second year of King Darius. So this now would have been 519, so 20 years after the decree of Cyrus. The word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, who just appears out of the blue here for the first time, and Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Now, you will notice, first of all, Zerubbabel is very much a Babylonian name. Now, even though he is going to be promoted here as a possible messiah, as somebody who might restore the kingship, but he's coming from Babylon, and he has his Babylonian name, and he has been Babylonized or something in the course of the, the exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Why would they think the Lord had not, the time had not come to rebuild the Lord's house? Well, hmm? Because they didn't have anybody to do it. Yes, probably. Uh, some people actually have argued that the 70 years predicted by Jeremiah weren't yet up. But my guess is that even if they said that, that was an excuse. You know, this was not the real reason why they were slow in doing it. And that becomes apparent enough here, actually. The word uh, of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, says the Lord, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you that earned wages, earned wages to put them in a bag with holes. I think this may be the first biblical reference to inflation. Uh, but now, I mean, you can get, you get a picture of the scene. They're just about barely getting by. The bit about living in your paneled houses is probably an exaggeration. But you see, it poses a question. If you have a group of people returning from exile, what should their first priority be? Should you build houses to put a roof over people's heads? Or should you build the temple? Now, OK, who's for the temple? <laughs> what do you think? Hmm? Yeah. Well, that's, you see, a very good point. And apart from unifying people, it's the morale of the community. You know, having a, a community project. There are plenty of parallels to this in this country. Uh, you know, if you go down to Hill House Avenue, you can see St. Mary's, this massively big church built by very poor people, mostly immigrants, but by building it, even if they couldn't get it onto the green, which they couldn't, uh, but nonetheless, you know, at the time, it was a way of making a statement. We have arrived. We are a community. We exist. And I think that's, 
the, the kind of secularized explanation, if you like, of what Haggai and Zechariah were up to, which is not to say that they were thinking in those terms. I think they may very well have been thinking that, it, because, you see, it was very much the traditional theology that the way to ensure prosperity is by the cult. That if God gets his sacrifices, all will be well, and everything will work in order. And this would have been very much the common theology of the ancient Near East. And I'm sure this is how Haggai was probably thinking of it. But it did have a certain social advantage to it as well. So, thus says the Lord, (coughs) go up to the hills and bring wood to build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Uh, You have looked for much and it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Because of my house that lies in ruins, and I have called for a drought on the land. And then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, obeyed the voice of the Lord, and Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people, and they went out and got a temple built. So it may not have been uh, anything to match Solomon's temple, but they got a temple up. But then, what happened? The danger, you see, of promising great things in response to specific action is that the great things don't always follow. And this now becomes, in, you know, in the later part of this course, we deal to a certain degree with apocalypticism and eschatology. And this is the great dilemma uh, or millennial expectation. And the great dilemma of it is, you see, it gives people hope. But at a certain point, if it doesn't happen, it can be a huge letdown. And one thinks this must have been the case already here with Haggai. In the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month, and the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai. Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Now, uh, you know, that is maybe not so much corroborating what you read in Ezra. I think the author of Ezra probably got it from Haggai. uh, but, But at the same time, I think it was probably, you know, a historical fact. Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Jeshua, the high priest. For I am with you, says the Lord. My spirit abides uh, among you. Do not fear, for thus says the, the Lord of hosts. Once again, in a little while. And at this point, you know, you're free to break into song if you know Handel's Messiah. I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Uh, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of the nations will come and I will fill this house with splendor. Now, the image you see is of shaking all the nations so that it jogs loose the wealth of all the nations and it all flows into Jerusalem. We'll see this again next day in 3rd Isaiah. Again, it's the, the, the dream that now Jerusalem would become the center of the earth and that the wealth of all the nations would stream into Jerusalem. This was actually, in its way, the liberal dream of the time, because at least it was maintaining that there is a place for the Gentiles in Jerusalem. Where somebody, like whoever wrote the last chapters of Ezekiel, said, you don't want Gentiles. The thing to do is keep separate from them. And this becomes a fairly sharp division of opinion, I think, in the post-exilic community. And you get quite different takes on what the restored community ought to be like, uh, whether you're looking at Ezekiel or at the latter chapters of Isaiah. So this is the promise then held up by Haggai. Towards the end of chapter 2, the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. 
saying, about, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. I am about to overthrow the kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the, na- the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. On that day. Now, by the way, what would have given him such an idea? Well, actually, when Darius came to power, there were widespread revolts. Darius was not a legitimate king. And he, he came to power you know, by, by murder and intrigue, and there was unrest in the Persian Empire for a couple of years. And this was probably the context here that uh, Haggai looks at this and says, see, it's happening now. The empire is coming apart. But of course, it didn't. But on that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, son of Shealtiel, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. What is a signet ring? It's the, the, the ring that um, a high official of the king would have so that he could put the royal seal on something. To put the, God's signet ring on Zerubbabel would be to make him God's agent. They don't use the word anointed or Messiah, but that's what it is. You know, this is what the king was. You know, the king is the agent of God. The king is to God as this high official with the signet ring is to the king. So you know, the question is then, should you say, could you say that Zerubbabel is a messiah? Now, a messiah is, to begin with, an anointed agent of God. Some of them were actually anointed with oil, but that isn't really the point. It, the point is that he's the chosen one, as he says here. When you get reference to the Lord's anointed in the Hebrew Bible, it's nearly always the king. There are The high priest was also anointed. The high priest can also be called a Mashiach. But when you get the word used without further qualification, it's the king. Now, after the Babylonian exile, the word takes on a new meaning. Because before the exile, uh, the king, all the king was supposed to do was maintain the kingdom. After the exile, he has to restore it. And this is from, from the, the fact that you had on the book, so to speak, a promise to the line of David that there would always be a king of his line on the throne of Jerusalem. When you then get to the point where there isn't, this is what we call cognitive dissonance, that there is a gap between that which is and that which is supposed to be. And the solution to the cognitive dissonance is that God would restore the kingdom of David. Now, it looks very much, Zerubbabel was probably, not certainly, but probably, uh, a, a descendant of the Davidic line. This would have been in accordance with Persian policy, you know, to let the traditional rulers rule so long as they behave themselves and are subject to the Persians. Uh, but, so it looks very much as if Haggai, at least, wanted Zerubbabel to become king, you know, to restore the independence of Judah. Now, this will not happen. It, we'll see a little more about it, maybe even some clues as to why it didn't happen in the prophet Zechariah, who was Haggai's comrade in arms, so to speak. Any question or comment on any of that so far? Yes. Well, I think the, the consensus would be that what we have in the Hebrew Bible, except for a few very late things, but the Pentateuch, the prophets, and so forth, that they had all of that. 
in Babylon. And it was they who had it, not the people who were left in the land. Because the exiles to Babylon included the priestly class. These were the people who would have kept the records. You did not have very many people who could read and write. So uh, these were the people you know, who then would get in time to define Judaism. Now, this will all come to a head in the book of Ezra, which we'll get to uh, probably after spring break, I guess. Uh, but um, you know, they, that with Ezra, you have another return. And Ezra is the one who is credited with bringing back the law. And I think the current consensus would be that it's the, the law had to be newly put together. There were bits of it that were very old, but that the Torah as we have it probably was a product of the Babylonian exile. Now, some people would say, how could they do that in the exile? But you see, actually, in the exile, they seem to have done OK, uh, as diasporas often do. <laughs> Uh, we have records of a Jewish family in Babylon who went into banking, starting a long and honorable tradition. Uh, we'll find in the book of Zechariah that the, the prophet says, collect gold and silver from the returned exiles. <laughs> this is also a long tradition. But um, they had it. You know, they were better off, by and large, than the people who stayed were left in the land. But in any case, uh, it does not seem to me that Haggai and Zechariah had the Torah. That at that point, the whole center of the religion was still the temple. Temple first, ideally also the monarchy. And that is what the, re the whole religion had been based around in the whole period before the exile. We then just before the exile, you had the Deuteronomic reform, which lifted up the Torah. But the Torah probably wasn't complete even then. And even in the book of Ezra, it isn't quite finished. But this was the, it is really during the exile, I think, that the, the Torah emerged as the focus of what it meant to be Jewish. Any other thoughts or questions there? Well, let's go on and look at a bit of Zechariah. <clears throat> uh, in the first chapter, now, again, uh, the, uh, what we call the redaction criticism of a book like Zechariah is too complicated to go into here. But there are, I think, authentic oracles from Zechariah, and then there are bits that are obviously editorial introductions, commentary, and so forth. And the first paragraph there in Zechariah is, I think, an editorial um, introduction, saying, in case you had forgotten, that the reason you had to go into exile and all of this is because God was punishing you for your sins. And what you now have to do is get back to keeping the law. This is kind of the editorial slogan put up front. Then you have a series of visions of Zechariah. And the visions of Zechariah now are more elaborate than most of the visions that we have had up to this point. And they, now, there's some precedent for them, I think, in the visions of Ezekiel. But the real novelty of these visions is that he has to have an angel explain them to him. We haven't met a lot of angels yet in the Old Testament, but they come thick and fast in the later books. They proliferated. And in, according to Jewish tradition, it was in Babylon that they came up with the names of angels. You don't have, the first time you meet a named angel is in the book of Daniel, which is the latest book of the Hebrew Bible in the second century BC. But you do have angels here. Now, you see, um, at any point, at any point in the Old Testament at all, in fact, and if you heard Paula Friedrichson last week, she talked a little bit about this, 
It's not really monotheism. The assumption is that the heavens are populated. And the point is, should you worship more than one god? Is there one god who has supreme power? But there are all sorts of other divine beings that we tend to call angels, but even as late as the Dead Sea Scrolls, they will often just call them gods. Now, on the 24th day of the 11th month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. By in the night I saw a man riding on a red horse, and the angel who talked with me said, I will show you what they are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees said, they are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they come back and report to the Lord, we have patrolled the earth, and the whole earth remains at peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, How long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, with which you have been angry these 70 years? The 70 years, though, is the period foretold by Jeremiah. Then the Lord replied with gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked to me. And he said, Thus says the Lord, I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, and I am extremely angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was only a little angry, they made the disaster worse. Now we got something like this last week in Second Isaiah, where it says that Zion had been pu punished double for all her sins. But it's the idea that, okay, there was some punishment for sin here, but that doesn't explain the extent of it. Uh, it just it got out of hand, so to speak. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with compassion. My house shall be built in it. This now is before the temple is actually built. My cities shall again overflow with prosperity. And then he sees a man going to measure Jerusalem to see what is its width, and Jerusalem will be inhabited like villages without walls because of the multitude of people and animals in it. Now, Ezekiel would not want a city without walls. Ezekiel wanted a clean dividing line between those who are in and those who are out. The vision that you get here in Zechariah, and you will also get in the latter part of the book of Isaiah, is the city without walls because you want people flocking into it. So it's a somewhat unrealistic, utopian dream, but a, a very optimistic one at the same time. <clears throat> In chapter 3, he showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, Joshua is the high priest who is there with Zerubbabel, and initially the two of them seem to be equally important. This would also be true in the latter part of the book of Ezekiel, it was a big change over against the earlier period when the king was very much the supreme figure. In the exile, the king had no power. The priest emerged as the, the leader of the community. And indeed, in most of the Second Temple period, it is the high priest who is the most important figure in Jerusalem. But evidently, some people were bringing accusations against Joshua. And so Zerubbabel, I mean, Zechariah, has this vision which is meant to exonerate uh, Joshua. And who is he's standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him? Who is Satan? Any of you ever hear of Satan? <laughs> we live in a, a Satan-free world, Matt. It's a divine prosecutor. Is he, at this point in his life, the devil? No. 
When does he get to be the devil? <laughs> Not yet in Job. You know, there, there are three places in the Hebrew Bible where Satan shows up. The best known of them probably is Job. And in Job, when the sons of God come together, Satan also comes among them. So he is a member of the heavenly council in good standing. He's still living upstairs. But his job is muckraker. He is the one who goes around testing people. Uh, here, he's kind of the heavenly prosecutor. So district attorney, whatever. He is the one who will bring the case against somebody who is accused. And you also get it in Chronicles, where you're told that it was Satan who, in, who, who encouraged David to take the census, which was a bad idea. But he will become the devil, certainly by New Testament times. Probably the second century BC is, was his coming of age. Uh, at which point he becomes a prince of evil. We'll see a little of this when we get to the apocalyptic literature towards the very end of the course. There was probably some Persian influence involved in it because the Zoroastrians had a dualistic view of the world where you had Ahura Mazda as the good god and Ahriman as his opponent. Now, Satan will eventually rise to that kind of stature as the opponent of God. But he's not there yet at this point. So Satan here is the one bringing the accusation. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a brand plucked from the fire? Now, Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And he said to him, See, I have taken your guilt away from you, and I will clothe you with fresh apparel. Let them put a clean turban on his head, and put a clean and clothed him with apparel, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. So the point of this vision is to say that. Don't bring charges against your high priest. No impeachment. There's now why he is a brand snatched from the fire. Well, you see, uh, <laughs> this is how they felt in Israel about the ultra orthodox when they were setting up the state of Israel. This is, you know, a. a, a this is a group of people who were almost wiped out. So you've got to be protective of them. And I think this is the line here. Now, notice how different this is from any of the earlier prophets. Amos, Hosea, Isaiah even, all go around criticizing. They're the critics of the rulers. At this point, Zechariah says the balance has shifted. You can't go on just criticizing the rulers like that. You've got to rally around them. They're all we have left. It's a brand snatch from the fire. We're lucky to be alive at all. And so what you need to do is rally around them, uh, defend them, protect them. So it's a totally different attitude to, uh, to the rulers. Also, then it says, you take away his guilt by changing his clothes. Well, you see, I mean, this is standard ritual performance, I mean, down to the present day. If you, at baptism, you know, often you have a change of clothing, which is what's supposed to signify a change in your spiritual status or whatever. And in the following chapter, as I am skipping over a chapter, I'll come back to it. In chapter 5, I saw a flying... Well, that's, that's the one I wanted. Um, uh, in chapter 5, verse 5, the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, look and see what this is that is coming out. And I said, what is it? 
This is very typical of the visions of uh, Zechariah, that he always has to ask what it is that he's seeing. And he said, this is, th this, th this is a basket coming out. <laughs> and he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. Then a leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. Does it bother any of you that wickedness is a woman? Yeah, there may be just a little bias in the symbolism. But admittedly, you know, it's not talking about women as such. It's just that this is kind of the imagery that they lapse into. And it's partly because see, both Haggai and Zechariah are very priestly. They're very concerned with purity. And uh, wi women seem to be more liable to impurity in that system for bodily reasons. Sorry, they... Oh, yeah, I think they probably did, yes. I think most of the rituals that you get in the book of Leviticus were probably very old. The book of Leviticus itself may not be that old, but those kind of priestly purification rituals would have been typical. The difference was, before the exile, you only had to worry about those things if you were going to the temple. Later on, you got to worry about them every day. That was the huge change in that regard. So in this case, though, they put the lid back on the basket, and they take it off to the land of Shinar, which is Babylon. What do you do with wickedness? Put it in a basket and send it to Babylon. Exactly. <laughs> yes. If only things were that easy. Backing up to chapter 4. The angel who talked with me came again and wakened me as one is wakened from sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see a lampstand all of gold. This is a menorah with a bowl on top of it. There are seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And by it there are two olive trees, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel who talked with me answered me, Do you not know what these are? <laughs> and I said, No, my lord. That's why I'm asking you. And he said to me, This is the word of the Lord. And at this point, actually, he doesn't answer the question immediately. You have a digression. People usually think this was an editorial insertion, but it could also be put there, you know, just to heighten the suspense a little bit for the answer to the question. The digression that's put in is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. O great mountain, before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. And he shall bring out the top stone, that is, for the dedicating the temple, and with shouts of grace, grace to it. Now, you know, a question that is often raised with regard to Haggai and Zechariah is, could they seriously have been encouraging somebody to rebel against the Persian Empire? Could they? Why not? Yes, that means it would be a stupid idea. Is there any, any reason why prophets might not have had stupid ideas? You see, these are prophets we're talking about. And notice the way he puts it here. Not by might. So the Persians have a much bigger army. No contest. Not by power, but by spirit. Now, if you think that the Spirit of God is going to intervene to help you, practical considerations fade into the background. 
Now, it isn't altogether clear that they were actually expecting him to rebel. I think they more likely they probably thought that God would just somehow cause this to happen. Maybe that the Persian Empire would break up and Zerubbabel would be exalted. But I would say that, you know, practical feasibility has nothing to do with it. It's looking for miraculous intervention. And they're hoping that Zerubbabel would be lifted up. Uh, and then, uh, finally, um, th these, then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left? Getting back to the question he had tried to ask before. And he said, these are, what are these two branches of the olive trees which pour out the oil through the two golden pipes? He said to me, do you not know what these are? You see, you get a little lesson in divine pedagogy here. <laughs> Somebody asks you a question, first thing you do is say, do you really not know that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I said, no, my lord. Then he said to me, these are literally the two sons of oil. Now, the NRSV translates it as the two anointed ones, and I think that's probably what it means, but the, the actual, that's not actually what it says. It's two sons of oil. And the point of it is this, that you now have two channels of divine agency. You have the king, the king figure, the governor, Zerubbabel, and the high priest. And this was a change. Later on in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they will talk about a Messiah of Aaron and a Messiah of Israel, a priestly Messiah and a royal Messiah. And this would be in accordance with life in the Second Temple period, where the high priest is actually more important than the king. But there is one more vision here in Zechariah that I want to get in before we finish. And this is in chapter 6. <clears throat> Again, I looked up and saw four chariots. And, well, <clears throat> in, in verse 9, the word of the Lord came to me. Collect silver and gold from the exiles. See, people still do this? You know, in impoverished countries where people have gone abroad and done well, you hit them up for donations. Take the silver and gold and make, now actually what it says in the Hebrew is make crowns. And if your, your NRSV says make a crown and puts a footnote, but it's amending the text. It actually says make crowns. And the reason it immense the text is it says, make crowns and set it on the head of the high priest Joshua and Jehozadak. And then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, here is the man whose name is Branch. Branch is the word used in Jeremiah to refer to the branch of David, the kingly figure. He shall branch out in his place, he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall sit upon his throne and rule. There shall be a priest by his throne with peaceful understanding between the two of them. Now, to whom would you think that oracle was addressed? Is it to Zerubbabel or to Joshua? You see, it only makes sense if you address it to Zerubbabel. And the irony of the passage is, you see, after he makes crowns, he's told, sit it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. But evidently, there was supposed to be a crown that was also set on the head of Zerubbabel. And this oracle saying, this is the man whose name is Branch, was evidently intended for Zerubbabel. So what has happened here, and I think it's one of the clearer cases that you'll find anywhere in the Bible, of editorial correction, where somebody edited Zerubbabel out of the text. Now, 
why would they do that? Well, it mightn't have been the smartest thing to make a crown and set it on the head of Zerubbabel. Because if you do that, word might get to the Persians that you're starting a rebellion. Now, I mean, that's speculative. All we know is that you have here a passage that was originally written with two figures in mind, the two sons of oil. One of them a royal figure, one of them a priestly figure. And then the text is edited to eliminate the royal figure from it, to edit him out of the text. You will never hear of Zerubbabel again unless he shows up in the midterm exam. Uh, no, but he disappears from the Bible at this point. Did he die young? Was he called back to Babylon? We don't know. He most certainly did not reestablish the kingdom of David. And it looks to me like both Haggai and Zechariah had hoped that he would. But then at some point, they say, well, the high priest will do. <laughs> Make your crown and set it on the head of the high priest. And from this point forward, down to the Maccabees, at the very end of the Old Testament period, you will not again have a king in Judah. And it seems to me that between, say, 500 and 200, there is no reliable evidence of messianic expectation. Now, there are some messianic oracles that we really don't know when they were written. Some of them may have been in there, <coughs> but there is no clear attestation of it. There is no case of a messianic movement. Now, when you get to the first century, Jesus wasn't the only one who came along. There's a whole succession of messianic pretenders. But after Zerubbabel, the last messianic pretender before Jesus, if you like, was Zerubbabel. And after that, I think they made up their minds that we settle down, we live under the Persians, it isn't so bad, and Ezra will come along with the book of the law and change the focus of the whole religion. OK, uh, now we will, this week, we also have a lecture on Friday. So we have lectures on Wednesday and Friday. On Wednesday, we will talk about the last 10 chapters of the book of Isaiah, and also Isaiah 24 to 27, the so-called apocalypse of Isaiah. And then uh, we will actually finish up uh, what we have to say about prophecy on Friday. <laughs>